let's continue with um, reading responsively from 50 onwards. Onwards, 23:50, Luke 23:50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. <coughs> Same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Aramata, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulchre that was hewn in stone. Wherein never man before was laid. Verse 54. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. And the woman also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. 56. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Let's pray and look unto the Lord as we open our hearts to hear his voice. Dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, this morning on the Lord's day, as we come to your courts, Lord, and in your, in your midst among your children, Lord, Help us, Lord, be with me. Give me the utterance and uh, give me the voice. And uh, you speak, Lord, to your children, that uh, we all may be uh, may hear your voice and be edified, and that we may be comforted and strengthened through your word. I pray in the most precious name of my dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, uh, the theme of the message is the significance of the burial of Jesus Christ. As it is significant um, in the Christian gospel, it's placed in the, the message of the Christian gospel, the burial of G the content. The gospel has uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is emphasized. Though the death and um, the resurrection are the crux of the Christian gospel and the message Yet the burial also is part of uh, the Christian gospel. It says um, in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse one to fourteen, the contents of the gospel message is mentioned, where Paul says, "What uh, I, again?" First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse one onwards, you can read. You can know, as you continue to read, I'm going to say the just the summary is what Paul is saying to Corinthian churches. What I have, um, I'm preaching what I have received from the Lord. And um, I am giving it to you. I'm passing, you know, I declare unto you the gospel. And the gospel message um, is something that uh, if you, you will be saved if you keep it in, in memory. Or uh, that message of the gospel should get into your, um, into your hearts. That's when you are saved. It's not just in your mind. If you have it in your mind, then um, as, okay, in order to be a Christian, I need to believe that Jesus died and he rose again. He was buried and rose again. But if you keep it in your intellectually and you don't have it into your hearts and you apply it into your lives, then uh, it's going to fade away from you. At some point in your life, that message will become unimportant and sometimes, and not sometimes, but you will have just have it in your in your brain, but it's not going to sink into your hearts, and it won't change you. So, gospel message should um, be in your hearts. That's what Paul is saying that you are saved if you keep in memory what I memory is like in your hearts. What I preach to you, the same the same idea. Peter is saying that if you do not fall, Peter in Second uh, Peter chapter one. Verse nine uh, and ten says that Peter is saying that if you, if you fall, if you with faith, if you if you follow right virtue, uh, virtue and virtue, godliness and uh, and through godliness this kind of um, godly love. If you don't follow after godly love, then you have forgotten that Jesus Christ has died for you. The same idea. If you your if the gospel message is not in. Uh, is ingrained in your in your whole being that Jesus Christ died for you because of uh, for your sins 
and he was buried and he rose again is not part of your daily life, then you're not saved. And that's what it implies. I was also trying this personally when I went to India, I was asking one of my loved one, like um, coming from a Christian, um, all or throughout her life, she was um, a Christian, brought up in uh, family prayers and everything. But um, uh, if that is not fully ingrained, if that is the, it is the gospel message is not the power of, of our lives, then what happens? Um, I asked uh, personally the question, oh, what is Jesus Christ to you? Or uh, people cannot answer properly a simple question because they might get the gospel message uh, that Jesus died on, on the Easter or the Good Friday, but when we don't apply it after to the end of your life, you won't understand who Jesus Christ really is, that he, he is our Savior and Lord. So it's very important. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, verse 7, that you are what you think. Hence, your personality, your whole being is what you, what you think in your heart. If you think you want to serve the Lord, you want to be fruitful, you will end up in the end being fruitful and serving the Lord. And if you think about the gospel, if you ponder upon the cross that Jesus died for you, then it will transform your life and my life. So the significance of burial is um, can be seen because it's part of the gospel message, as Paul says in uh, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse three onwards, says that for I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and um, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you notice it, notice on the fourth verse, it says that Jesus Christ was buried. So this morning, I want to briefly give um, the significance and um, how we can apply it into our lives, uh, the burial, which is clearly mentioned in this, uh, in all of the gospels, that the burial of Jesus Christ um, in seven ways, for you just for you to remember is that the burial of Jesus Christ first of all it emphasizes that Jesus Christ phys Christ's physical death he came as a human being and he died as a human in his human body and he was buried he died and that is by his burial it's a seal it's a seal saying that he surely died for our sins in his human body it's not like a a mythical figure or like some angelic being that has no physical substance or body, but he is, uh, he is completely human and he died for our sins and he was buried. So the second point is that the Old Testament prophecies were also fulfilled by his burial. Clearly in Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that he was buried with uh, the rich Joseph of Aramata is a very um, well-to-do person that he had his own um, tomb set up for him that he, he has given up for Jesus. Thus, that is mentioned in Isaiah 53 verse 9. And, and also his burial is mentioned in the book of Psalms 16 verse 10 about that it was written that God would not allow his holy one to see decay. Jesus' burial in the tomb owned, uh, is owned by Joseph of Aramathe, a wealthy man, fulfills the prophecy. Second um, emphasis, uh, significance is that the God's, what was mentioned in the Old Testament by his burial, it's, it's fulfilled. Fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah and his resurrection on the third day shows that he did not see decay. That is uh, the significance. Though he, he was buried, he was his um, body did not decay. His holy one will not see decay as 
Psalm 16, verse 10 says. The third one, the third point is the burial of Jesus Christ sets the stage for the this great event of the dawn from darkness, or the, we were singing the song, right? Sets the stage for this great historical event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that happened 2000 years ago. It's the burial, though it's, uh, we can call, call it as a silence or a pause, but it highlights the resurrection and the hope for every Christian who truly believes in this gospel message that Jesus Christ died for our sins. According to scriptures, he was buried along with him. He, he took all of our sins. He was buried and his body did not see any decay. And then sets the stage for the message and the truth that, uh, that on the third day, Christ has risen from the grave. Death has no power over our Lord Jesus Christ because death cannot hold him. He is God, eternal God. So that's uh, three things that uh, the burial sets a stage for um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and uh, the claims, uh, even the Jews during the time of Jesus, uh, when you see that in Matthew 28, verse 11 to 15, the Jews did not deny the fact that uh, Jesus' body was buried. They gave money to the soldiers in Matthew 28, verse 11 and 15, uh, to tell them that the his disciples took the the body of Jesus and they gave him big amount of money as the elders and the Jews take counsel and gave large amount unto the soldiers, saying that his disciples came by night and stole the body while we slept. And they said that we are going to convince the governor also. He'll persuade the governor. So even the Jews, the Jewish leaders, did not deny that Jesus died and was buried. They were trying to uh, somehow cover up the story. If that was the case, that Jesus was did not die and was not buried, the disciples and uh, all the Christian Christianity, the early Christianity, wouldn't have um, had so much of passion. Passion, and uh, if Jesus Christ truly did, indeed did not die. So even the gospel message also would have gone to all the place, to the ends of the world. So the third point is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ highlights, uh, the, the burial of Jesus Christ highlights the, and sets the stage for the resurrection of our Lord on the third day. And one more point is that the burial of Jesus Christ marks the end of the earthly ministry and giving way to a new life. The end of Jesus' earthly ministry and uh, to dawn of a new regenerated life. Not only for Jesus, for all, all the believers in Christ Jesus. If you have hope in Jesus Christ, this world... And this life in this world is, is not the only thing that you hope for. There is hope beyond the grave for every believer. Whenever we see uh, somebody die and buried, that's not the end of that person, dear ones. That's not the end of his life. There is something beyond the grave that is hidden at this time. but. Um, that's the end of this earthly journey and uh, giving way to an, an entrance and a great opening to the glory that we can see on the third day how Jesus has risen from the grave, from the grave with great power. Uh, not only the burial gives all these illustrations, but it, it has a symbolic significance. The act of burying Jesus has a, has a symbolic significance for all Christians. It uh, represents the, the finality of uh, death and the hope of re resurrection. It is just, it's a reminder that just as Jesus was buried and rose again, 
so too will believers will would die in Christ and rise again. So we can relate it to every Christian as a, a symbolic representation that we also will go through the same um, process how Jesus Christ died why as we die in this body and as we are buried we will also rise again we will be risen with with similar to the bo bodies of Jesus Christ it should give us great hope for personally we can apply it to our personal lives so death should not uh, make us fearful or when we see somebody's burial that should not make us um, dis or like cause discouragement a, a mother en encourages um, her dying son in this way in in a um, in a fictional story a book written by a christian author called Catherine marshall reflects on what it is like to die in the in this fictional story of a 12 year old boy named kenneth in the story, Ken, Kenneth was suffering from an incurable illness. As he grows weaker and weaker, he begins to worry about what death will be like. How will this death be like? Uh, at one point in the story, he this child turns to his mother and says, Mom, what, what is it like to die? Does it hurt? So this... Uh, lady this mother was were overcome with emotions she goes to a different uh, to her room she weeps and she comes back with great uh, strength and she says can it do you remember when you were younger when you used to play so hard and so you were so tired to undress yourself you just fell asleep in my bed what happened uh, do you remember when you rang in in the morning you would awake to find yourself in your own bed in your own room Though in the night, like you were tired and you slept, you tired and slept in, in my bed. You remember in the morning, you were again in your own bed, sleeping in your own room. Do you know what happened? Your father had come with his strong arms and carried you there to your place, to your sweet place. And she says, death is like that. You will awake up to find yourself in your own room where you belong because Jesus will cares for you and he will carry you with his strong arms. Though in death, we, it appears that we are not, uh, we have lost everything or we don't have anything, anything that is in our control. Our life is out of control, but the Lord is full, fully in control of our lives, of every, every being and every person that he, he, he has ever created. God is greater than more you can imagine. God is somebody, I always ponder about the nature of God and it amazes me how he is so great and in, in the way that how he deals with all of us in a very special, personal, intimate, uh, real, knowing everything about us to the finest extent, more than we can know. Still, um, he cares for us and he has great plans for us and he loves us, um, he loves you. Um, as if um, nobody else is there and is willing even though like you're the only one that's born in this world he would come and give his life for you that is the love of jesus christ that's something that we still don't understand but one thing we know that god is eternal and he cares for every person that he has created so death is no more a, a pain a sting a believer death burial and resurrection of jesus christ in is part of the gospel message and his burial is a sy symbolic representation that for a christian when we die and when we are buried that's not the end of our life we will rise again not only that but it spiritually identifies us with christ not only symbolically but spiritually, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 10, gives this idea that his burial, his death and his burial, is saying that our old man is crucified with Christ. 
the body of that the body of sin might be destroyed as part of his death we are buried with him we are buried with him verse 4 says that we are buried with him by baptism into the death we are crucified with Christ spiritually we are identifying we are baptized in Christ and we are we we are crucified with Christ spiritually because the spirit of Christ is in us though we are born 2000 years later still we have the same spirit if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask God to give the Holy Spirit to us, He will surely give the receive our prayer and He'll give us the Holy Spirit. If you have the Spirit of Christ, then you can um, you can identify yourself with Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, when you identify, when you are in Christ, then you are in the in this rock. Of that Jesus Christ is the rock. Many times we sing so many songs like uh, Rock of Ages and all those things, but we should apply it into our hearts, into our lives, that Jesus Christ is, um, it should be our, our, our center of our life. And as Jesus Christ died, spiritually we also died, he carried our sins and he, he was buried. Then we, our old man was also buried with him. What it, it means is that, that by his final death and leaving in the body, you are freed from, uh, why, as you are buried in the baptism in his death, when you die, then you will be also freed from the presence of sin. So spiritually, you are uh, identifying himself. What, what it means is that you... All your past sins are buried in, in Christ with his burial. As you identify with him, as Micah chapter 7 verse 9 says, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon you, upon us. Let's turn to Micah chapter 7 verse 19. <clears throat> it's pointing to our past sins. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast out their sins into the depths of the sea. So our sins that we have done in the past, our old life, we should not remember it again. God said, your iniquities as far as east is from the west. So far have I removed your uh, transgressions from from you so when god is willing to cover our sins i will when god is saying in this when you believe in the lord jesus christ and you are part of his new covenant bible tells us that you, i will remember your sins no more god what god is saying that he has decided not to bring up those sins before you and him when god is saying that if you believe in the lord jesus christ and you receive this love of god and you want to have a relationship with him, God is promising that I will remember your sins no more, that you should not again dig the grave and take your past sins, not the guilt of your sins, what you have done in the past. You should be willing to forgive yourselves and to forget your sins that you have done. As God is willing to forget, forgive you, you should also should be willing to forgive yourself. And to forget what you have done in the past. Nor when you're giving this, when a testimony about Jesus Christ, you don't uh, have a testimony that what Jesus Christ has done in your life, that you don't have to bring up your uh, past sins and give a list of all the sins that you have done. So that the other, those are not unconverted, and those that are truly are converted also might hear all the things that you have done, and probably they'll say, this guy, if this guy has done, they might be tempted to do such kind of things as the Bible tells us that it's not even, uh, it's not a good testimony to bring, even to speak about, mention about those things that are done in darkness and in the past. Sometimes we fail to forgive ourselves. 
sometimes we fail to uh, to forget what we have done in the past as god is willing to bury our sins that we should also be uh, to move on in life always remembering the goodness of the lord then also the guilt the blood of jesus christ will remove also the guilt that sin brings us to so that we can say clearly sin shall not have dominion over a believer as um, romans chapter 6 verse 14 this is um, the governing principle of a believer or this is the mark of a believer romans 6 verse 14 for sin shall not have dominion over you this is the mark sin shall not have dominion or will not take charge over our lives as a believer though you will be influenced you will be caught up or like you will be uh, you have this presence of sin and this the influence of sin in in our lives but sin shall not control our lives though it's not saying bible doesn't say that you are perfect or without sin but that will not take control of our lives sin shall not rule over our lives because of the power of the gospel the gospel is foolishness to them that perish but the gospel to those that receive it it is the power of god if the power of god is in your life sin shall not have dominion over a believer is that true in your life sometimes we as part of the sins we may we may bury our sins and forget our, our sins but we may not bury the sins of those that um, others have done to you we may still remember and bring up the past we may dig and bring up sins that already that you have granted forgiveness say okay i forgive you when the time comes when the argument starts then again okay this is what you did many years back or something that should not be we should be willing to forgive and forget and do not and cover it and bury it bury even our brothers and those that have offended us because when we focus on on the love of god though it's true all this in theory when it comes to the practical aspect of it there is this reality of temptations and sins that are present in uh, for a christian so 1235 let me um, give you a break by telling um, off topic so that you'll so we had last week we had a messengers uh, meet where like we all, all the messengers aggressively try to um see what can we do to improve the timing and other things we had a very strong discussion how to cut down the timings and maintain timings and all and uh, the main message should be only for 45 minutes <laughs> and um, all the other messages so we decided to stick to our timings so i also planned it such a way usually for my messages i have only three pages uh, of notes for 40 and it goes for like close to one hour this time like um, i prepared for 45 minutes a sermon but now i have four pages instead of three pages <laughs> so that's that's fine i know that you are all eager to your hearts are very willing to hear the voice of god so um, you are very gracious <laughs> you continue to listen however i will see what i can do i have a timer <clears throat> so the reality of temptations and sins are always um present for for a believer a believer's responsibility is to be an overcomer as 
this governing principle for a believer, this dominant um, mark of a believer is that sin shall not have dominion over a believer. Means a sin will not rule over him or over her life. As Micah chapter 7 verse 19 also says, says that he will, um, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities. So as a believer, we are overcomers. Yet, how as a believer can overcome? It's not just um, me preaching saying that you cannot, you should not sin and um, you should overcome sin and leaving the stage without telling you how. Uh, I won't do much justice to my message or um, it's not complete. Right? right? I can always say, um, do not sin. You be good with God and um, always never sin. Never, uh, always forgive others. But the next day, you, if I don't tell you how can, can you achieve it, then it's, it's not going to help us. So I was just counting, if you are not, if you are not growing now, what makes you think that you will grow later? I'm just putting this statement to myself and to you. Just a challenging question. I'll repeat it again. If you are not growing now, what makes you think that you will grow later part of your life? 2023 Sunday, I remember, uh, and um, fr from first Sunday, it looks very, very near, right? 2023. And I counted the number of Sundays. Today is the 18th Sunday of 20, the first Sunday of 2023. 18th Sunday means one third of this year is, is past. And again, the same question. If you're not growing now, what makes you think that you, that you will grow later part of, of the year if already one third is gone? Bible tells us that if we are not doers of the word, but just hearers only, we are deceiving ourselves. God is always the same. God always is loving. He always gives opportunity. And if you are the same, if you are still continuing to be what you are, if you are continuing to be like, oh, for example, like your phone, you're busy with your phone when the message is going on, you will continue to be the same. If you continue to disregard um, spiritual things, you're busy with um, um, games, video games, when spiritual things have to be given importance, or if you come, continue to dis dishonor God, what makes you think that anything will change? In the end, like we are the ones who, who will be deceived. If you don't have this earnestness, this diligence, this will, will, willingness, this heart's cry, Lord, change me. That what makes you think that at uh, some point in your life you will change? If already 18 weeks have, 17 weeks have passed, one third of this year is gone. But for all this, God has given his instructions how we can change. I'll give you seven points. The first one, as I've always been telling you and always reminding you is the word of God. The word of God is so important for a believer that the word of God will do this great magic, will transform you in your personal life, in, in, your, in the Bible study that God enables believers to gather together, that you memorize it, you study it, you, you meditate on it, and you, the word of God will build you up. God word, God's word will, will come to your rescue, no matter what, what has Jesus. When he was tempted, God, the Lord Jesus Christ used the word of God. The word of God is a source for our sustenance, for our spiritual sustenance for, for us to live. By every word that comes out of the mouth of God, we will live, we will grow, we will build, and we will be established. That we should be, that we can be wise. Word of God will make us wise. Word of God will give us a power to overcome our sin and our temptations. 
how can a young man learn is take heed to his ways by taking heed how can a young man learn his way is by taking heed to the word of god if you don't regard god's word if you don't give the time that is needed to to personally study the word of god spend time before him and um, able to study the word of god if you look at the old testament the word been is um, uh, is is used almost um, many times I, i don't let me see don't have it here but um, many times probably more than uh, in the new testament it was used 18 times the greek word diakrio krino as been is uh, used as to discern meaning is to distinguish in the old testament also it's used more than 10 times 10 to 20 times i think it's more than that i don't have the exact number here but i can't say but um, it is the meaning of been is used many times in the old testament as a primitive word root which means to to separate and to distinguish to separate out to to separate mentally to to understand to consider to be uh, diligent to be direct and discern to all these words to perceive to be prudent to be skillful and to be uh, to be understanding to teach to think to cause make it to uh, to understand to view and to to be wise many times this word is used been and in deuteronomy 32 29 it says oh that they were wise moses is saying uh, to the the enemies of israel and the those that uh, have israel's captors moses is saying in deuteronomy 32 was 29 in fact god by the mouth of moses is saying oh that they were wise oh that they were wise that they may understand understood this that they would consider same word being discern their later end their later end so many times we only look at the present but there is a time there's a day that god has appointed that every one should be before him and give an account for everything that we have done what what god has given to us that we should give an account for all that so as god's children the word of god will help us to make us wise and also uh, with the word of god is the spirit of god that will come to your rescue when we be in his presence and pray and ask god for help the prayer god's word and prayer should go together dear ones as we pray and ask for help god's spirit will enable us to be overcomers other practical things for a christian is that many times when we are we have this this drive to sin that we always set aside god and we think that it, what we do is it's good for us we don't we should remember at that point at the moment that we we want to disobey god we should remember that god is good all the time especially when you and i are tempted we should remember that god's will is good and god is good he he is willing to do everything for our good not that he, your will will make you good but god's will will make us good it's for our good that we when we follow the will of god it is for our good remember um, adam and eve when satan will come and tempt um, eve and adam and eve that satan will tempt saying that god is not good and he falls to the trap of the devil thinking that god is not good if you eat this food if you eat this fruit you believe that god is not good because if you eat it you will become better you will know from good and evil and all those things believing and making them believe that god is not good 
But in every situation, if you believe whatever that you're going through, that making you to be tempted, you just pause for a moment and believe that God's will is good and God is good. God has the best thing. God has the best plans for you. Then it will help you a lot to overcome and to do the will of God. And when we go by faith, remembering that God is good, so the word of God, prayer, and remember that God is good. And the fourth one is sometimes when we go through difficult times and um, trying times, we are so tempted to, uh, to sin. Just like Job's wife, curse God and, and die, something like that. You have to remember the word of God which says that the same afflictions are accomplished in all the saints in First Peter chapter 5, verse 9. What it means is it's not just you that are an exception. It's not that only you that are going through all of these pain and suffering and all the problems and all the temptations and nobody else is going through. The word of God tells us that same and similar afflictions or trying times are being accomplished for every saint who professes that he is a believer, God will send forth his, his way of trying them and correcting them and pruning them and disciplining them. These are some of the things, some practical things, word of God, prayer, and um, remembering the goodness of God and uh, remembering that the rest of your um, brothers and sisters are going through the same Situations like you, there's nothing, exceptions that you have to give in, that you have to succumb. That all of those that are godly will suffer persecution. All those that are God's children shall go through the same kind of trials and afflictions. So the fifth one is, you have to be associated with a local church. And you have to be associated means you have to be strongly connected with them so that they can also lift you up. They can You can together grow, together protect, together safeguard till the day of his coming. God has blessed us, blessed, the, uh, blessed us the saints and plan to have local churches in, in, in this world. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Be not deceived, do not be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. No matter what you think, if you say, okay, probably for some time I'm going to associate with a um, uh, few of the people that don't have good um, faith system or like they, uh, they are different, but still by associating with them that I might also give the gospel or something. But there is this danger as long as you have uh, the right goal. Fellowship is very, very important. You come to the church, not only to worship God, to serve God also, you have to remember that you come to, go to the church, to the local church, to, to share the joy of God's people, sharing all things in co common fellowship. The early church did that. Be part of the integral, be an integral member of the local church. Be fully connected. Be fully be uh, accountable and be fully responsible. And uh, be fully be willing to take, um, take any correction. Any correction, dear ones, with humility. And with a thankful heart, thank you for pointing out my blind spot. So that's the fifth one. The sixth one is that if you, you all know this saying that an idle man is a devil's workshop. So that's a worldly statement. But you have to take some responsibility. If you're not taking responsibility, you, you are prone to wander away because we still have this corrupt, um, the old man 
that is still dominant in us unless we are transformed by the word of god and by the power of god and unless, unless we sub subdue it and we it will allow it will come back up if you're if you're not fed daily by the spiritual food unless the bible tells us that we should be occupy yourself in the work of the lord luke 19 13 says and he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them occupy till i come if you are given a responsibility you don't have time to think about anything else you'll be so busy with what god has given to you with that you're so busy with that and um, if you are not busy then you ask the elders or somebody to give more to you because if you're free then it it's it opens up a door for uh, the flesh to do all kinds of crazy crazy things Bible tells us, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So the last point is, uh, before that, if you're free, then you become uh, a busy body, it says, the Bible tells us in First Peter chapter 4, verse 15, if you're free doing, uh, if, that doesn't mean that you're completely free, but you have some free time, then you can become a busy body. Busy body is somebody who is so curious about other people's matters. First Peter chapter 4, verse 15, this busy body is associated with a murderer, thief, and an evildoer. Peter associates this person who is so curious about other people's matters with um, a wrong intention, not with a prayerful heart. If let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Dear ones, God has called us into his marvelous light to, to love him and to serve him and to bear fruit. So the last point, if all of these also are essential, but the most essential one is that you should turn your focus towards the cross and the gospel message, which is the power of God, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and that marvelous kindness that Christ has offered on the cross, uh, the marvelous kindness of God at the cross of Calvary, that message of the gospel should transform you should the gospel you should live on a daily basis let us close in prayer the loving heavenly father lord we come to your throne of grace and we thank you lord for this word that you died for us on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures you were buried and you rose again on the third day according to the scriptures lord for our purposes lord we pray that help us lord to Truly, really, Lord, have this passion to follow you and to subdue all of our iniquities and to grow from strength to strength, Lord. Help us, Lord, to commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.